Coming up this week, we explore the extraordinary life of Eunice Kennedy Shriver. How did she transform Americans' attitudes toward the intellectually disabled, and what is her lasting legacy? Also this week, let's talk about your dreams. What do they mean, and does sharing them make you healthy? And they are called the Forgotten Generation, but their legacy lives on in the movies they gave us. We explore the most memorable movies from Generation X. All that and more on your Saturday Evening Post Week in Review. Hello everyone and welcome to your Saturday Evening Post Week in Review. My name is Chris Wakefield and I am the Marketing Manager for the Saturday Evening Post. I'm Nicholas Gilmore and I'm a staff writer at the Post. I'm Troy Brownfield, I'm also a staff writer. There's so much you want to get to this week, but first of all, let me tell you, like I do every single week, you can become a member to the Post for only $15. That gets you a one-year membership to the Saturday Evening Post exclusive access to our online archives, six new issues of the Post every single year, and exclusive member benefits. So spring is right around the corner. You'll be traveling pretty soon for spring break and vacations. If you are a member of the Post, you get exclusive discounts with rental car companies and travel companies like Enterprise Rental Cars. So if you're a member, go sign up now and see what special rates you can get with Enterprise Rental Cars. Now, uh, there's a piece in our latest issue, our January February issue, about Eunice Kennedy Shriver, and uh, some people call her the Forgotten Kennedy, or they call all the women in the family, I guess, the Forgotten Kennedys. Um, Troy, did you read this piece, and what did you learn about Eunice Kennedy Shriver? I did, and um, it was really interesting to see, um, like you said, kind of the marginalization of the women in the family overall, which I, I think we kind of know intuitively but it this really spells it out and the thing that you know she's known for is starting the programs that became eventually the special olympics right but it, it's kind of telling um with the attitude that you know joe senior their their father had about the boys versus the girls in the family that's you know there's a remark he made about if she were male then she would have been a politician you know completely discounting the idea that as a female she could have been you know in political office or and she goes on to create this great legacy with the special olympics uh did you learn anything from this piece in the magazine yeah i think um you know when it uh comes to uh, stories of women in that era um, i mean we've heard a lot about the kennedys over the years so much but uh this is i think one angle of the Kennedys is definitely worth revisiting is uh, the contributions from people like Eunice. Uh, and yeah, that was documented in the Saturday Evening Post. I think in the 60s is right. when that piece was. Do you have a uh, favorite Kennedy? A favorite? No. Uh, the Dead Kennedys, in fact. <laughs> the, the band. Dead <laughs> Schwarzenegger! Je Jello Biafra. Arnold Schwarzenegger goes on to marry who's, Eunice's daughter. Mm -hmm. Who's your favorite Kennedy? Schwarzenegger. I just said it. It's, He's He's a Kennedy by proxy. Kennedy. Go get the magazine and read this piece on Eunice Kennedy Shriver and her, her legacy in helping um, change the way Americans looked at and perceived people with mental disabilities. And again, a lot of great work she did with these Special Olympics. Next thing I want to talk about um, is a piece, let me look at my notes here very obviously, a piece uh, Nick did that it's talking about dreams and how you perceive your dreams, and is it healthy to share your dreams with others? Yeah, so uh, we've been studying dreams for a long time. We as, uh, like, mankind. Three of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, uh, well, not, not that long, actually. Obviously, people have known about and talked about dreams for a long time. The study of dreams kind of uh, really hit this critical point in the 50s, and there was a 1960 story in the Saturday Evening Post uh, that was sharing some of those insights about REM sleep and how most of your dreaming goes on in REM sleep. At the time, we thought that only REM sleep had dreaming in it, which was later disproved. But, uh, and the importance of dreaming, which kind of brings about this question is, of, like, is just deep sleep? I mean, deep sleep is obviously important. Is, is that the most important thing, or is actual dreaming important? Um, which no one is really quite sure. There's a lot of unanswered questions about dreaming still, but um, there are some, uh, you know, aspects of dreaming that we've found to be uh, beneficial to people. 
um, it, just in terms of uh, experiential, a uh, sort of ethereal, experiential thing, uh, psychologically. Yes. Um, you can experience something in dreams that you might not be able to experience in the real world. Um, there's a theory about uh, the threat simulation theory um, that uh, we've evolved to dream because it prepare us, prepares us for threats. Um, like, I mean, it's a pretty common theme. Falling. Dreaming. Did you, um, did you have a dream last night? If I did, I don't remember it. Did you, Troy? Same thing. If I did, I don't remember. I had a dream last night that uh, there was a robbery at a gas station, and they were coming after me. With how a gun. did you, How did you defend yourself? I went to the refrigerator, <laughs> one of the refrigerators of the gas station, and I grabbed a can of Coke. Nice. I opened it, and I like, you shook it up first. No, I like crouched down on the ground and <laughs> drink it. Sip his stolen Coke. So I failed the threat simulation. <laughs> That is funny. But, um, no, and there there have been studies recently about uh, sharing your dreams and right. how that can be beneficial psychologically. Um, yeah, there's a lot of psychological benefits, but still a lot that we don't know. Do you, do you share your dreams at all, or do you just, like, do you even remember your dreams? Um, only on occasion. I, you know, don't really talk about them that much. I usually think that, you know, I would be boring somebody else if I talked about it. Just on dreams? Oh! Um... <laughs> It's, yeah, I would welcome a conversation from Troy about dreams. So do you find it cathartic that, you, that when you share your dreams, do you feel like you're releasing something, or...? I think that, like, if you're the type of person who can turn any story into, like, a punchline, or uh, insert catharsis in any story, you probably can make it interesting, and if you're not, then... We're going to do a special episode where Troy does 30 minutes on just his dreams. We're going to get it all out. So it's the last 10 minutes of The Godfather, and I'm Michael Corleone, <laughs> and the other families are all the people that made me upset in high school, but instead of Diane Keaton, Kate is Scarlett Johansson. There you go. <laughs> we got to stretch that to half an hour. I can't wait. Go look for Nick's piece on dreams at SaturdayEveningPost.com. The next piece we have comes from Troy, again, over at SaturdayEveningPost.com. You, uh, we were just talking about movies earlier. You did a piece on how Generation X movies are still relevant and how they really made a mark on the history of Hollywood and that generation. Yeah, it's um, really taking a look at the movies that had something to say about Generation X rather than, you know, oh, these are Gen X's favorite movies because then you're talking about, you know, things like Ghostbusters and whatnot. We're talking about movies that have to say... Reflective. Yeah, something about it. And so yeah, that was brought on because it was... You know, and this will hurt some of our watchers. The 25th anniversary of Reality Bites. Wow. Um, so it kind of gives you a context about exactly how long it's been since these movies happened. And, and for the most part, they're movies that were kind of coming out contemporaneously with the coming of age of Gen X. Uh, your Generation X, if you're born between 61 and 81, according to most of the, the charts. Um, and, you know, a lot of the things that were concerns then are still relevant to teens, you know, especially things like bullying and interaction and different romantic entanglements. But um, there's also a little bit of safety in it because it operates at kind of a remove because this is all stuff that happens before social media and a lot of the well, other conceit. Kind of I was going to say, particularly, is it Slacker? That's uh -huh. like Austin with mm -hmm. the moving camera and everything. I think that it's really interesting to watch because you can see how people interact. Um, I mean, not that nobody lived during that time, but you can like watch, uh, I think it would be interesting for young people now because you can watch how people did interact like before social media. Yes, it's very kind of much like so. A carefree um, existence. Imagine the breakfast club in 2019. Fun. Yeah, they'd all be on their phones. They wouldn't be looking at each other. You're damn kitsch. Yeah, well, well well, and it's it's funny that you mentioned that because um, a Not movie to say that, it's better or worse, but it's no, it's interesting to think about it that way. I I, I think it's a great point, and um, you know, in the movie Hot Tub Time Machine, there's a funny bit where the the one much younger nephew of John Cusack is part of the group that travels back to the '80s, and he's talking to a girl, and um, he says, "How do I find you later?" And she says, "Will you come look for me?" And he says, "That sounds exhausting," <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's so funny, but it, it's kind of this this truism that you know at that point. You did kind of have to, you, you didn't have a mechanism, nobody had cell phones, you didn't have a mechanism to keep track of people, you had to go to parties and places to find people, 
and Nick made the comment to me earlier in the week about um, a lot of the, the films that are represented in the list, like Breakfast Club and so forth, have a whole lot of people just sitting or standing around talking to each other. But that was the baseline for interaction. It was It was interpersonal conversations and occasionally long phone calls which nobody does now everybody is super quick to get off the phone or they're like oh my god why didn't you just text me you know it's not you know as common um my favorite gen x movie uh that is really reflective of that generation is arachnophobia um again you can look for choice <laughs> piece over at saturdayeveningpost.com now it is time for my favorite part of the week we call it don't at me we're going to talk about things that might be getting on our nerves, pissing us off a little bit, get under our skin. If you want to vent about it, don't add us. Just let us vent. We'll start with Troy. What do you have? I'm just going to keep it brief. Um, you know, Jesse Smollett turned himself in um, on the basis of this particular case where the police suspect that he lied about a hate crime. And all I would say is that I hope he confesses to this quickly, assuming that he did do it, because this has done untold irreparable damage to all of the black, gay, Muslim, etc. kids that are eventually going to get bullied and become the victims of these crimes themselves. It's going to be much harder for them to report them and be taken seriously in the face of this thing that's happened. Not, not a good situation for anyone involved. Nick, what you got this week? This is a very, like, old man complaint. Oh, can't wait. That's new. So... <laughs> I went to the dentist yesterday okay. for cleaning, and I made this appointment, like, last week. I mean, it wasn't even very very long ago. And they do this thing now where they, like, text you to confirm. And right. They're like, text 2858, yes, to confirm your appointment. Ah, yeah. Well, I don't know when this started happening, uh, but I texted back, 2858, yes. And then they, like... They did, like, try calling me, and I was just like, no, I'm not answering, I'm not talking to you, I made my appointment, I confirmed it, whatever. I show up, and they're like, um, we canceled your appointment because you didn't confirm. And I said, I texted you back, I whipped out my phone and showed them, and they're like, well, you had a space in between the number. Oh, and no. I'm like, I made an appointment. You don't need, you nothing show after up. that should matter. I made an appointment. Did you get to have the appointment? They still did it. Wow. They still, you right. know. How many clouds did you yell out afterward? <laughs> I've, I've been mad ever since. Wow. Do you want to name them right here on the air? You want yeah, to, no. no. <laughs> I'll name somebody. Universal Orlando <laughs> has this new walk-around character that you can meet and take pictures with, and it's from the movie Trolls. I've never seen this movie. My mother has seen it. She's a grandmother, and she is tired and annoyed at this movie, apparently. It's very <laughs> earwormy, like Frozen. Um, and they have this new character that walks around. You can go on Twitter and look for it. And apparently in the movie, one of the trolls farts glitter. As you do. As you do. As trolls are meant to do. And so this character that walks around the theme park farts glitter. And it's this whole build up to it. And it's in a song. And like it hits the post. And the fart comes. It's, it's amazing. And people pop for it. They go nuts. There's a class of people, of theme park people. Mostly <coughs> Disney. It's mostly Disney people like Disney like super fan people who are just appalled by this is disgusting how could you let your child see this there are two-year-olds watching this and they'll emulate it it's yeah it's a fart it's it's, a, it's like come on of all the things you can be outraged about in 2019 I don't think a farting glitter troll is very high on my list would you would you shield your child's eyes from this no, I think it's a ridiculous thing to get upset about. You know, what are they? Are, are they saying they want to go back to the old days when trolls ate cattle and stray children and <laughs> hobbits? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just. I don't get it. I just, it's a theme park. You're there to have fun. Have fun. Just chill out a little bit. All right. Once again, if you want to subscribe to the post, you can do so. SaturdayEveningPost.com/slash subscribe. A one-year membership is only fifteen dollars. You can explore two hundred years of the Saturday Evening Post archives, six new issues, and a lot, lot more for only $15. So go jump on that as soon as you can. Nick, where can we find you online? I am on Twitter at Darwin, at, at Darwin Jr. with a Y. I am also on Twitter at Troy Brownfield. I'll, before he gets back going, I'm, you can find me at Wakefield Report, and you can find the post everywhere at Saturday Evening Post. Don't forget, you can watch the show or you can listen to it as a podcast on your favorite podcast provider. And we have more podcasts for you also. Little Rocco Minute, 
History Minute. Go look for those on Apple iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. That's all we have this week from Metazor Brewing. We'll see you all next week when it's quieter. <laughs> and we're not moving steel furniture across the floor.